Coca-Cola after an internal memo showed diversity training where employees were told to be, quote, less white. It's part of a company racism training program. People taking part are given advice on how to be less white, less arrogant, less, uh, less certain, less defensive, and less arrogant. A spokesperson for Coke said it's just part of training meant to create a, quote, inclusive workplace. I do. So I think there's a lot of learning that's taking place and a lot of awareness that is uh, happening. I wasn't as aware seven years ago when I had my son about the racist images in a lot of Dr. Seuss's children's books. The story everybody's talking about this morning, that big rebrand of Mr. Potato Head, the classic children's toy now has a gender neutral name. and. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. I know what you're thinking. Why are you still in the original studio? What has become of the interim studio, of the new studio? Relax, we're getting there. But in the meantime, I came back to Michigan to pick up a few things and also to record two very important videos for you guys to tide you over until the new studio is up and running, at which point the content kitchen will be firing on all cylinders. We'll be cranking out videos like the Biden administration bombing Middle Eastern countries. You love to see it. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, uh, what we're talking about here today, I do want to go over a few things as it pertains to the, the channel as a whole that I think are important. I'll probably have to explain the jersey here at some point. But before we even get into that, I have to tell you something. I have to remind you of something, which I'm sure you already know because you're a genius. You have agency. You analyze the trends. And that is the fact that we're living in uncertain times and millions have come to realize the importance of the Second Amendment. If you're looking for the perfect access to go with that perfect firearm, get an American-made holster from my friends at We The People Holsters. Starting at just $40, We The People Holsters are custom molded to fit your exact firearm. They have thousands of options, including an amazing selection of printed holsters. Their proprietary clip design allows for you to easily adjust both the cant and ride of your holster so it's comfortable and secure at all times. Go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle. While you're there, check out their premium printed hoodies, long sleeve shirts, their new EDC tactical gun belt, which comes paired with the patented Cobra buckle. Every holster and gun belt comes with a lifetime guarantee. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back for a full refund. WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Doyle. Get an additional 10 bucks off with the offer code Doyle. WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Doyle. WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Doyle. Very epic. Now, let's address the elephants in the room. And I plan on repeating all of this information in the other video as well because I think it's important. And so I might just shamelessly recycle the footage. But I'll put a timestamp up right now so that you can skip this if you'd like. But about two weeks ago, I put out a two hour long dissertation on the harms of pornography that is literally irrefutable, hundreds of sources. And I did this all completely free of charge, maybe because I really do just care. Maybe it's like Elijah Schaefer said, maybe I'm mildly autistic. I don't know. But the point being that the video was posted. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you for participating involuntarily in the made a commentary on the importance of delayed gratification. It was all a metaphor, but I do just want to take a second to talk about that video because the responses have been overwhelmingly positive uh, and inspirational, the comments, emails, messages, everything. And you might remember that the video was literally being censored by Google after it was posted. Like you could search for it on YouTube or on Google word for word and it wouldn't show up. But then you search for it on like DuckDuckGo or something and it would come right up. And it couldn't just be because the title of the video contained the word porn because other videos with that word and their titles would come up, including the one that we did last year, which was much less thorough. And that really just puts into perspective what we're up against because that video wasn't some big treatise against leftist economics or anything even explicitly political. That part was additive. That was the only part that is relatively up for debate. That video proved that pornography is extremely addictive, that it has addicted the vast majority of the men in this country, and that it is harming them psychologically, spiritually, sexually, etc. It proved that. And then from there, I extrapolated that if we continue to exist in that condition, then we will ultimately lose our country. That part I still believe, but I acknowledge that's just my inference. But the rest is irrefutable. And so what that means at the very least is that they wanted to stop you from realizing that our country's men are harming themselves and perhaps that you're harming yourself, uh, which if if you remember 
is something that I said in the video, that they literally want to hurt you. And if you subscribe to what I believe is a completely reasonable inference, which I outlined in that video as well, it also means that we're correct in saying that the people pulling the strings are using pornography as a weapon against you because they know that it demoralizes you and will eventually enable them to totally conquer you. So just keep that in mind because ultimately this channel was not started to recite decades old arguments against centrally planned economies. It was not started to introduce contemporary arguments in favor of federalism. It was very simply started to help people and that's not a virtue signal. Like speaking very honestly, it's actually a political strategy because, you know, obviously we care about helping people, but I'll share with you something that I realized a very long time ago, which is that this battle that we're in, if it were an intellectual battle, then we'd never lose, but we are. We're losing badly and we have been for a very long time. And that's because it's a spiritual battle and we're not well. That's why we're losing. And so we want to help people because ultimately that is the pathway to success for us. And that's why this channel is so heavily targeted because they know that if we can heal enough people spiritually, then we will just march down the field. And we just made some pretty decent progress with that. We just helped thousands of people break or begin to break their pornography addictions. Imagine what that butterfly effect is going to look like. I'm thinking about getting billboards too, spread awareness. I don't know, more on that later. But the point is that we all knew that this video was going to help a lot of people and it has, and that's great. And just today is a Jacob Wool moment, but I was in a coffee shop. I was planning out these videos. I'm there for 10 minutes and this kid comes up to me. And if you follow me on Instagram, you saw this because I posted on my story about it. You should definitely follow me by the way, because I post pretty good content throughout the day. But he comes up to me and he's like, bro, your video changed my life. I'm done with porn, bro. I'm done. Total Chad, totally high energy. But of course, this is just one side of the coin. Because remember, we knew that it was going to help the boys take control of themselves but we also knew that we were going to get lots of backlash from the weak, pathetic, degenerate men of society. And we were correct because of course, we're always correct. And it's important to note that I could have made a two hour video about why vanilla ice cream is inherently right wing, which it is. And nobody panics because it's all part of the plan. But you make one two hour anti-pornography dissertation, well then everybody panics because it's not part of the plan because it highlights their degeneracy and their deviancy and their insecurities. And so they have to attack it, painfully predictable. And so I would just like to take a second to illustrate the difference between the types of people that we're dealing with here. Take a look at the coffee chat. I'll point out what we're all seeing. I'll point out the obvious. You've got an extremely positive canthal tilt. Those are the hunter eyes. You've got a steep angle on the brow ridge as indicated by the sheer volume of his eyebrows. Obviously the locks of flowing hair, wider set nasal bridge, and the cope shield makes it difficult, but you can still see there's a very strong jawline present. He was about 6'1", solid shoulder to waist ratio. And so you take this guy, you take the coffee chat. Now compare him to any one of the guys who got triggered by my anti-porn dissertation. I don't think I need to explain any further. I think the vindication speaks for itself here. You have the average porn fan versus the average hawk appreciator. That's all I'll say about that. There's a strong connection between your spiritual health and your outward appearance, and the aforementioned dichotomy exemplifies that quite well. It's like it's like we talked about in the video, the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence. You've got the low IQ, well, you're ugly, and you got the average IQ, well that's actually an ad hominem attack, and then you've got the high IQ, you look spiritually unwell, therefore I will not listen to you, though I will pray for you. Who needs dopamine when you have vindication, boys? The last thing I'll say though, um, a lot of people have been asking how they can help the channel or help what we do as far as that goes. I don't know. As far as like the channel goes, the best thing to do, uh, go to the website, heckoffcommy.com, get a membership over there. That's how we keep the lights on. That's how we're able to do this, do cooler stuff, make better content, put up billboards, who even knows. And I try to only talk about it like once a month or so because I don't like plugging it. But you know, if you want to help, that's the best way. And then you get access to a bunch of cool features through the website. And we're actually, we're going to be putting a lot more content on the website once we get the new studio, the stew as a uh, proxy cameraman, although calls it up and running. Uh, a lot more content in general is going to be coming out. We got big plans for this year. Very exciting. So if you want to help, go to the website, get a membership. It's only a couple bucks a month. And then you're literally helping bring people to our side, making them more disciplined, ultimately helping to build a pretty strong coalition. So we're excited. And remember, the more memberships we sell, the sooner I can have kids. And so if you're curious to see what happens when I start multiplying, that's the way to do it. I actually, you know, jokes aside, I think that'll introduce opportunities to teach about homeschooling, building relationships with other young conservative families, things like that. I don't know too much about that right now, but when I do and I'm working through those things, I think it'll be good to share with people. So anyways, that's that. Very epic. And now we will talk about woke capitalism, which is something that has totally blindsided conservatives. We never expected it. And we really don't have any idea how to combat it. And even now, no one is really offering any solutions. And so I figured that I throw my hat in the ring, give my thoughts, but I'll start by talking about my jersey here because I've had this Patriot sticker on my my laptop for a while and people are always like oh he's a Patriots fan and so I'll explain the lore which is basically that I'm not necessarily a Patriots fan and I'm not even necessarily a football fan I'm just a Tom Brady fan and that's for two reasons the first of which being that he's a great source of inspiration for me because people keep being like Tom Brady's gonna lose and then Tom Brady keeps being like hmm disagree 
And then the other one is that I noticed that all of the worst people in the world consistently root against Tom Brady because he's white, because he's a Trump supporter, most importantly, because he's successful. And leftism is fundamentally just the political mobilization of the insecure. And they hate winners because it reminds them that they're losers. And so they hate Tom Brady because Tom Brady wins games. And I could literally make this into its own two hour dissertation. Why supporting Tom Brady is inherently right wing. But I will finish by saying that as conservatives, we acknowledge and respect hierarchy. We acknowledge that success and competence are things to be aspired to, not to be envied or punished. And that requires accepting that Tom Brady is the goat. And I don't even want to hear, well, mud deflate gate. Well, he kissed his son on the lips. Yeah. Who spoon fed you those narratives? The communist mainstream media. That's who. We're about to get into the NFL, how it ties into woke capitalism. I just, I have a lot to say. I haven't been behind the desk as much as I would have liked to have been recently. I'll tie this up by saying that the window of appreciation for white male excellence is closing. And so have fun with it while you can because it's closing quickly because even when Brady signs to a new club after 20 years in New England and wins yet another championship at 43 years old, you have people claiming it's racist just because he's white. And if trends continue, then white men aren't going to be able to be successful at anything anymore because we'll have to abdicate and yield to women and people of color because it's not about equality of opportunity anymore. And it's not even about equality of outcome anymore. It's about everyone getting a seat at the table except the white men because they think that you're evil. It's actually total equality of outcome. It's like cumulative equality of outcome in the macro timeline because what they're saying is, well, you know, white people occupied these positions in the past, so now they can't anymore to make up for that because that's how we solve racism. So enjoy it while you can. Enjoy your Tom Brady's. Enjoy your Donald Trump's, your PewDiePie's, your Mike Lindell's, your Jake Paul's, all while you can because the woke doctrine is a cancer. It's not self-containing and it's going to spread everywhere. And again, this doesn't mean that people who aren't white men can't be good at things. Professional sports as a whole are like disproportionately dominated by black men. It's just to say that for whatever reason, white men are told that they have to apologize for being good at things simply because they're white. And that's dumb. So, you know. But anyways, the NFL is a good segue into what we're talking about because the NFL is an example of something that has monetized political correctness very successfully, especially considering the degree to which it exists in American society. And I'm not saying that this is done necessarily with malicious intent, but I'll give you two examples. And the first one is applicable to all professional sports, which is that they exist to monetize what is effectively inconsequential and politically correct tribalism. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with sports, with following sports. That's not the point. The point is that the average American man, having been fed propaganda throughout his entire life, is sooner to take issue with someone criticizing his sports team than his state, his country, his church, etc. Like, we don't even know what it means to be a man anymore. We don't know how we're supposed to exist in society. We don't know what it means to be an American. We don't know what our purpose is. And so we just invest all of that into sports ball. And we buy the tickets and we watch the game and we identify with our team and we will live and die by it as though it's something more important than what it really is, which is literally just a sports team. And again, this is not to say that sports don't bring people together or that they're unimportant. This is just to say that human nature is predisposed towards tribalism, us and them, which by the way, doesn't mean that the them group is bad or worse than the us group, uh, just that they're different, which is an obvious reality. And we're not allowed to acknowledge the existence of us in terms of nationality, in terms of faith, in terms of culture, in terms of gender now, but we're totally allowed to channel all of that into the incredibly lucrative and totally woke enterprise of professional sports. Daddy, today at school, we learned that America was founded upon racism and genocide and that white people owe reparations to everyone who isn't white. Oh, and also that Russell Wilson is closer to being a top five QB than Aaron Rodgers. Damn it, I told you we need to take kids out of schools. It's the same thing with the last Super Bowl. Politically correct tribalism. Remember the Will Ferrell ad? Beat Norway. Norway's lame. Grr, Norway. Everyone thought that's so funny. Why? Because it was funny. Picking petty fights with other countries during one of the most widely broadcast events in the year is objectively a good bit. But ask yourself this. Are we ever going to see a Beat Mexico commercial or something similar? No, we're not. We're not going to see a let's bring our jobs back from Mexico type commercial because that would be offensive because Mexico isn't a white country. You can only poke fun at white countries and white people, just like you can only criticize white countries and white people. And this is what woke capitalism does. General Motors, which is one of the biggest companies in the country, they take out an ad during the Super Bowl, which is one of the most significant events on the calendar of the United States. And they get funny man Will Ferrell to be funny. And they basically get to tease the literal country of Norway like, hee hee, hey, Norway, we're going to get you. We're going to, oh, oh. Oh, we're coming to get, ah, we're going to get you. And then everyone's happy. We feel this manufactured sense of unity as a country because we're mobilizing our screen people during the big game to bully a European country. But then the reality of the situation is that General Motors has a pretty bad habit of pouring jobs into other countries to displace American workers. Because as we'll talk about, woke capitalism has no ties to country. They don't care about America. They don't care about the American people. They just care about money. And they view you as a source of that. And they know that if they put funny man on the screen and tease the silly Europeans for a minute and a half, then they can make you clap like a seal.
And so in understanding woke capitalism, we have to be clear because woke capitalism doesn't mean the coffee shop in your neighborhood that has the gender neutral bathroom signs. That's not what we're talking about. We're basically talking about conservatives having a real Caesar moment when the big businesses and capitalism that we've spent the last 40 years shilling for are actually working steadfastly against us and our interests. And so to answer the question, how do we combat woke capitalism? Some will say we can boycott. As you may have noticed, that doesn't actually work. Some will say go woke. Uh, what is it? No, get woke, go broke. You may have noticed that it actually isn't true. And even if it were true, it wouldn't matter because they're not actually going broke. Worst case scenario, they're losing like a little bit of money. But even that doesn't matter because what we're finding out is that people don't actually pursue what is most profitable. They pursue what is most valuable. And there is a difference because money is just a physical manifestation of value. And so what we're learning is that to the Leninists occupying these companies, going woke is more valuable to them than making money. And in many cases, it's even worth losing money. And we'll come back to explain the corporate Leninists. But to answer the question, how do we combat woke capitalism? We don't because we can't. And the reason for that is that capitalism is a machine. It is a system. It is amoral. It simply monetizes what is popular and it also creates and supplies demand. And so it's not a problem that can be solved with a few boycotting campaigns or what have you, but rather the symptom of a problem that will take decades to solve, assuming that we can even solve it. And that problem is that we have monetized our own self-destruction. Why is that? It requires a few components, most importantly being that there's a demand for it. And this doesn't mean that the demand necessarily exists, which of course it does. But just as demand leads to supply, supply can also lead to demand. Like you can put things in front of people that they didn't know that they wanted or that they didn't know even existed and you can create demand for it. And it's even easier to do that with information uh, in the marketplace of ideas, because when you control the narratives and the flow of information, which they do, you can make people believe pretty much everything and believe it passionately. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, you've got some people who legitimately believe these things, but more importantly, you have the masses. You have the masses of people who cannot think for themselves and frankly, don't even have any interest in thinking for themselves. Like so much of right wing, right wing discourse is centered around, please, can you read these statistics proving that Black Lives Matter is predicated upon a lie? Bro, please, can you debate me on this subject so I can own you? And it's like, no one cares. They post a black square on Instagram because the screen people told them to. You're swiping up like, actually, if you read the independently conducted autopsy report, bro, no one cares. You care and I care. Like, that's great. But the average person doesn't care. And they will just conform to the predominant trends and narratives in society, which is why it's important that we take control of them. And this isn't brainwashing, by the way. It's not like if the actual brainwashing stopped, then people would just agree with us anyways. But no, it's not brainwashing to control the narratives to make them acknowledge the reality of gender, uh, family structure, life, morality, and what have you. It's actually the opposite, which is allowing people to flourish in a society that doesn't seek their self-destruction for the expansion of the power and wealth of a tiny minority and allowing them to do so without having to live their lives within a constant flow of information because that's not how life was meant to be lived. But we have to do that now so that we can put the communists in the ground, metaphorically intellectually, intellectually, so that our kids and grandkids don't have to worry about it so intensely. And this gets back to the corporate Leninists. And I'm using that term loosely to describe a broader reality, which we'll get into. But basically, the timeline of leftist history is a cycle of exponentially more complex mental gymnastics where you take a theory and then you make a prediction based on it. And then when the prediction doesn't happen, you just double down and explain how your theory is actually still correct. And then you repeat this until you achieve tenure. And so the original Marxist theory was that the workers of the world would unite and realize their exploitation and they would have a revolution against the capitalist class. But then that went ahead and didn't happen. And so Lenin came through and said that the masses would never start the revolution and that they needed a class of revolutionary elites to occupy the institutions and society that would grant them the power and influence to educate the masses. And then the revolution could happen. Now, does this mean that every time some company goes woke that it's because there was a Marxist scholar behind the decision? No. Sure, like, yeah, some of these people in these positions that are pushing for this stuff are legitimate Marxists, but the vast majority are just overly educated, eternally progressing virtue signalers. But when it comes to who is allowing these things to be pushed and to enter the mainstream, that's a different discussion because the people at the top, they can stop this woke stuff within a business day if they wanted to, but they don't. Why is that? Because ultimately, wokeness is good for big business. It's definitely not good for small business, and it's definitely not good for the economy, but it is certainly good for big business. Just look at where big business put their money in 2020. They know that this coalition, you know, it's, it's probably going to piss off a lot of their customers in the meantime, but ultimately it's going to bring them more power and more wealth because it's going to consolidate the majority coalition in this country to be perfectly aligned with whatever the mainstream narrative is, which is how these people are so delusional that they think that they're the counterculture despite having the support of every institution in society. What are the consequences of wokeness? Mass immigration, feminism, also known as increased supply of labor, also known as decreased cost of labor, promotion of anti-Americanism, also known as 
as erosion of sovereignty, also known as global free trade, which has been bankrupting our country for decades. Because remember, big business has no allegiance to our country or to its people, just to their money. And while we have to deal with the consequences of their decisions and their propaganda, they can just live in gated communities. They can go live somewhere else. They are post-national. They have evolved past the concept of a nation or a homelander, so they think. They're globalists. And so given this, I would present two simple rules. The first one being that the state can either rule over the economy or the economy can either rule over the state. Someone's going to be at the top of the power hierarchy and it's either going to be the state or big business. And the problem with it being big business is that we can't even vote them out. The amount of power that big business has over you and me in this country would be the focal point of a wet dream for a dictator of days past. What does this mean? Well, it means that the government should be able to guarantee my freedom of speech in the new public square. That's what it means. They should have they should have that power before some woke tech company has the power to take it away under the guise of private companies, which they ultimately seek to destroy anyways. And secondly, that politics is downstream from culture, but culture can also be downstream from politics. It isn't just a one-way street. It can go either way. Now, here's a thought experiment. Here's a thought experiment. Just ask yourself if these could be true. Is it at least possible that the United States of America, like many other nations throughout the history of the world, will reach a point where it will be impossible to salvage her? Is it at least possible that the left, given how rapidly we've arrived at this state and given how little power we have left in society, will do that damage within the next 10 years? Is it at least possible that given that we have spent the last century losing the culture, that we don't have enough time or power to take back the culture, which would influence our politics? Given that politics can influence culture as well, and given that we can still hypothetically win elections, is it at least possible that the only path forward is to win elections? Now we reach the obvious objection. Well, we've been winning elections this whole time. We've controlled the presidency. We've controlled all three branches of government at least twice. Well, what's different this time? So true. So true. I don't know. Let's continue the thought experiment. Given that our old attitude of don't use power because that's what the left would do. And even while they're doing it and beating us, we're actually winning because we have our principles. We're beautiful losers. Given that that hasn't worked out at all and given that or assuming that I should say, assuming that we care more about the future of the country that our children will grow up in than we do about these abstract principles, which might I remind you are literally the reason that your children are being indoctrinated into questioning their gender, into abandoning God into hating you and into hating themselves if they're white, do you understand how incredible that is? That they shifted the literal United States of America, the greatest nation in the history of the world, to where it is now in less than 100 years. Can you believe that? How did they do it? They did it because we had weak people representing us, so-called conservatives, who in effect have conserved nothing except their status as losers. And I don't need to remind you that when you lose in politics, it doesn't just mean, ah, we'll get them next time. No, it actually means that you and I are going to have our lives destroyed, literally. We don't exist in their version of the future. They don't want unity. They don't want us. So where do we go? Where do you think? What'd they do to the opposition throughout history? Think about it. But anyways, given all that, is it at least possible that the only way forward, assuming that there is a way forward, is to elect people to represent us who are capable and not afraid of wielding power the same way that our enemies have done to us in the last hundred years? Is it at least possible? I don't know. It's just a thought experiment. I think I used the word enemy there perhaps accidentally. I don't know. I've just always operated under the assumption that whoever wants to take my rights away is my enemy. And given that the communists have no allegiance to my country, I don't exactly know if I should grant them the exemption of countrymen. Are you seriously suggesting that communists shouldn't be allowed to indoctrinate tens of millions of people into supporting the destruction of the United States and its constitution and its economy and its culture and its history and its way of life and its language and its values and its future? That's not very conservative of you. Yeah, you're right. You're right, because if there's one thing I've learned studying conservative politics, as much as I have, it's that actually wanting to conserve the country isn't conservative. No one actually wants to conserve anything. Even Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, it's a toy. It's still a staple of American culture. Conservatives think that they can just like let all the little things go. They can just prepare to conserve all the important things, but then they just go ahead and don't conserve those either. But the reality is that you have to defend everything. It's the horseshoe theory, yet again. You've got the low IQ people like, no, not potato head, damn it. And then you've got the average IQ people like, are you really upset about a potato? Then you've got the high IQ people like, apathy towards incrementalism results inevitably in absolutism. Oreo is pro-trans, who cares? Me, 
You actually have to stand up. I'm inclined to think that they would have just kept it Mr. Potato Head gender neutral if people hadn't gotten mad about it. But even the compromise is a loss for us. Even the idea of, hey, we're going to keep Mr. Potato Head, don't worry, but we're also just going to add more gender neutral potatoes. And then conservatives go, Phew, as long as I can keep Mr. Potato Head, I'm okay. It's that other stuff I didn't like. But here's the thing. We all knew that even though they're potatoes, even though they don't have any discerning features, we all still knew that they're Mr. Potato Head and Mrs. Potato Head. Everybody knew that. But now as they have their 21st century rebrand, our children are being introduced to these ideas through their toys. This idea of, well, if this potato wants to be this gender, then it can be. Or if it wants to be this gender, then it can be. And it can marry the other potato, any potato it wants. Look, there's no difference between them. They're all just potatoes. And again, that's true. But what's happening here is what's intended to happen here, which is why they did this in the first place. And you know that this is true because LGBT organizations are celebrating this as a victory. So they'll say, what? No, you're crazy. They're just potatoes. But then they're actually celebrating this because they know what it's going to do, which is teach children the framework for what they will then be taught thoroughly when they get to school, which is that there is no difference between boys and girls, not mentally, not behaviorally, nothing. And if there is, it's only because of social constructs. The only difference between boys and girls is their reproductive organs. And even those don't decide what a boy or a girl is. That's up to you. Anyone can be a boy if they want to be. Anyone can be any gender they want to be. None of this has to make sense because it's being taught to children. And the iron law of propaganda is that the earlier you start conditioning, the less it actually has to make sense. That's why they do it with toys. You got the Miss Monopoly feminist wage gap propaganda game. It's literally about brainwashing the masses, like starting as young as possible to be a member of the homogenous coalition of woke that can be mobilized at an instant to give power and wealth away from the American people to the ruling class via the privatized propaganda apparatuses that are owned and controlled by that same ruling class. But hey, at least it's not explicitly the government, right? Right, conservatives? China's brainwashing Muslims, what the heck? Meanwhile, American children are internalizing the same genre of harmful propaganda, but it's okay because it's mostly being done by private companies. I don't want the Chinese telling the Muslims what to think, damn it. Hey dad, I saw the same thing on TV about us and we talked about it in school and no, nope, not now, son. I'm trying to explain what I heard on Fox News. What's the recent example? Hyatt, Hyatt got backlash for trying to justify that it hosted CPAC in Orlando, sure. Keep in mind that's the exception, not the rule. The woke coalition is cancerous and it will infect everything. And here's another question. CPAC is very basic tier conservatism, very establishment, very tip of the iceberg. And apparently we can't even have that. Even that is unacceptable. Then what is acceptable? Ask anyone who's mad at Hyatt right now and they won't have an answer. And it's not because they're hypocrites and it's not because they're stupid, they're dumb. It's because the answer doesn't exist because nothing is acceptable. They don't want unity. They don't want you. We have nothing in common anymore. There is nothing under which we can unify. It's irreparable. At this point, we're basically just fighting for control over the economy, the military, and the geography of the country. That's why we actually have to support the companies who are still American companies, not post-national companies, not even transnational companies, American companies. That's the most important factor when I take sponsors. So keep that in mind. They're taking a risk by actually prioritizing the American people and also by affiliating themselves with yours truly. iTarget's a great example. They make a sled that integrates with your smartphone to allow you to do dry fire uh, training with almost any of your guns from your own house. It's epic. Go to iTargetPro.com to check it out. Use the offer code DOYLE, get a discount because we have to stick together. This is gonna this is gonna be a very long process of undoing. I wish I could have sat here and told you we can beat woke capitalism by boycotting. But as we've explained, the reality is much worse than that, which is that woke capitalism properly understood is the consolidation of a woke coalition that seeks to impulsively sacrifice wealth and power to the ruling class because they've been convinced through propaganda that it's in their best interest. It is the monetization of the destruction of our country, literally. The day-to-day -day might just be, oh, Mr. Potato Head's now gender theory. How crazy can it get? But that's the macro trend. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and of course, share the video with a friend. We love that. We love sharing the video with a friend. What's that? What's that you ask? Oh, how am I going to bring the grand to the, to the new studio? Oh, you're right. I guess I'm going to have to leave it here. You know, I'm actually sad to hear you say that. I am sad to hear you say that because you're assuming that I only had one. Do you know how big of a problem hentai is? Do you know how big of a problem Japanese cartoon porn is? You think I'd only have one grand? This will defend. Thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America. Poof.